wow, this week I had my first teacher's class and it totally blew my mind. It was a pretty big sized group of people, many of which I had not met before. They were all podcast listeners and it was so engaging and it felt like you know, what I do here on the podcast on like a one-to-one level was happening in this group and they were interacting amongst themselves and with me and it just felt like really powerful inquiry. And it felt like a really cool space that we were entering into together to have it. And I'm just like super excited about it. The really great thing is that it's ongoing. It happens again next week. It's a weekly meeting and a monthly subscription. And I'm just excited to find out what we, what we get into next week. I can't wait. And if you want to get in on it, it's the Jay Brown Weekly Teacher's Class. You can find it at jbrownyoga.com. All right, we're on. This is Jay Brown Yoga Talks Podcast. My name is Jay Brown. Here we are again. That is, of course, if you're a returning listener, maybe you're not, maybe you're new, in which case, let me welcome you. I appreciate that you are choosing to listen, whoever you are. How are things with you all? I had a whirlwind of a week, you know, things kind of picked up quick since I got back into town, which is, you know, something I've always thought about, like, it is summertime, and I felt like there was a time in my life in the past when summertime felt like things slowed down, you know? Felt like you could relax and you didn't have to work. Maybe that's just me like reminiscing to the days when I like was in school and you had summers and, you know, I wasn't working. <laughs> I can't remember when that was, but I don't know. Summers don't feel all that different, you know? Still had a lot on my plate. A lot of it was good. I recorded some very cool podcasts this week, my friends, which are going to be playing out for you over the next three weeks. Not today's podcast. Today's podcast was recorded like six weeks ago at the Desika Char celebration that Leslie Kamenoff hosted at Kripalu in June. I'll tell you more about that in a bit. But the podcasts are kick ass, just really interesting and engaged and like really cool people. I will tell you who they are in a little while. But mostly I've just been um, like doing domestic stuff, like the house, this, this 1900 Victorian house of ours is an ongoing project. And those of you been around for long enough, you remember the story that is the miracle of us getting this house. We continue to love it, but you know, there's always a list of things that have yet to be done and new things that come up. Anyone with an old house knows what I'm talking about. So I'm sort of focused on that stuff a lot. But also I got into a little bit of like some, you know, exchanges on Facebook, which is something I just haven't been doing anymore. I haven't been making comments on Facebook, but I, um, I made a comment or two. They were interesting exchanges, though. I don't regret them. Often, of late, whenever I make a comment on any kind of social media thing, I regret it later. And I've been really kind of moving away from them. But it's just a, like a lot, a lot brewing, you guys. Things continue to brew, and I can't talk about everything, but I've got some other stuff that might be in the works to be talking about. And just, wow, the shifting underfoot continues in terms of like, you know, where are the authorities for yoga if there are any anymore? (laughs) And what makes things authentic? And... Yes, well, we'll be sorting it all out in the weeks to come. And today's podcast with Sriram 
is a really good place to start because Sri Ram is a fantastic person that I met for the first time at this Desika Char event in June. I, I knew nothing about him really. My friend and teacher Mark Whitwell was there and actually was instrumental in bringing him to America for the first time for this conference. And, you know, I had it in mind that I might get to record some podcasts while there. There was like a whole cast and crew of like big name teachers who I admire and would love to get a chance to speak to. But, you know, it's like a conference and it's a pretty full schedule. So I just, I wasn't all that confident that I was going to get like a real sit down. But I got this one with Sri Ram. We went into a a room that someone was staying in, I believe it was Sri Ram's room, and we just had this totally amazing conversation about TKB Desikachar and his father, Krishnamacharya. Also, honestly, I didn't know that Sri Ram was so instrumental in the situation with the women coming forward against Kaustub, the son of Desikachar. And if you don't know what I'm talking about in this tradition, the Desikachar tradition, uh, there was some scandal and, and we talk about it. And I didn't know that he, he was so instrumental in what happened there, but he was in Germany when the women came forward. I, mean, I discover it as you will in the conversation. But more than anything, it's just, it's really um, a lovely feeling that I had with him and I think it comes across. And so I'm excited for you guys to hear it today. Before we do, let me mention that today's episode is sponsored by yoganatomy.net, which is the online education resource of Leslie Kamenoff and Amy Matthews. And Leslie is the whole reason why today's podcast came about and all three of the podcasts that are coming about over the next few weeks. He's a dear friend of mine and the work that he does is important. I've used his courses in my trainings. In fact, if you take his principles course online, You'll see me there because I just happened to be in the group that they were using to film for the online course, and I was full of questions, so you'll get to hear him answer all of my questions. Leslie and Amy are an invaluable resource. You've probably read their book, Yoga Anatomy, and I encourage you to go back and listen to the episodes that I've recorded with them. I've just, I've learned so much from them. If you need to study yoga anatomy or if you just want some deep yoga learning, I highly recommend you go to yoganatomy.net. I also have some gigs coming up that I might mention. I'm going to be in Falls Church, Virginia at the Yogi Underground August 10th through 12th. I'm going to be in Rye, New York at Wainwright House August 26th. I'm going to be in Hamilton, New Jersey at Bamboo Yoga September 15th. And I'm going to be in Burlington, Vermont at Burlington Yoga September 22nd and 23rd. You can find out about those gigs and more. You can listen to the archives of this podcast and read my blog and find out about my online yoga video stuff, including my new teacher's class, which started this week, and my ongoing live stream subscription and my DVD and downloads and my online workshop, Gentle is the New Advanced. All of that stuff can be found at jbrownyoga.com. All righty. I will touch base with you on the other side, and I'm going to tell you who's coming on in the coming weeks. Very exciting. But for now, let me take you to this wonderfully in-person conversation, me and Sri Ram sitting right next to each other at Kripalu in the Berkshire Mountains in June 2018. This is me and Sri Ram. Okay, say something so I can check a level. Oh, yes, okay, so we're going to do a podcast. <laughs> yes, we will. We are here, you and me. Oh, I feel okay. like I'm far away from you. Let me get a little bit closer. Yeah, sure. That's okay. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Okay. Yes. So let's see. Sri Ram. <laughs> here we are. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for this. You know, when I um, spoke to Leslie about coming to this uh, conference, yeah. I said, oh, I, 
I'm very busy, I have a family life and all these things. I don't know if I can make it, but when will this ever happen that all of these people will be in the same place in the same time? Yeah, sure. And I said, and I, gosh, I would love to be able to record a podcast while there. And he said, well, I, I don't know if you're going to be able to, because as we were discussing on our way up, the way everything's organized, uh, yeah. the way you find time so that we've managed to steal this moment together mm-hmm. and that you agreed to do it. I'm just, I'm very grateful to you. So thank you for that. Yeah, it's nice. <laughs> and, and I'm excited that you're the person that I'm speaking to because of all the people on the um, docket, um, you're the person I had never heard of before. Uh, and I'm, that's sort of where I thought I might start because where have you been? Because <laughs> you know, like, clearly I heard you talk um, yesterday and you had a, a deep relationship with Tessa Qatar yeah. and you speak wonderful English and you, you lived in Germany. So I bet you speak German too, right? Yes, I do. And I guess you mentioned also that this is the first time you've ever come to America. Yeah. So I'm just wondering why that is. Have you just been hiding out or what's the story? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I was very much at home in India, at home in uh, my work teaching yoga in India. And for me, the step of moving to Europe was very big. And, you know, it was a step, long, long, long step away from home. So I didn't want to... N- expand if it was not necessary and actually there never was an occasion where you know I was either invited to come here or where I said I would like to go and do something there so it never happened Mm -hmm. and my son moved to England so I have some sort of a relationship to the UK also so I just you know straddling so many cultures and continents is not so easy that's probably the reason why I never made it a goal to come here and be here Mm. Until I was invited here to this conference. Mm. Well, you mentioned just now that you you were teaching yoga in India before yeah. you left to yeah. go to Germany. Yeah. So that's interesting to me. So you when when did you start your studies with Jessica Chara? I started when I was twenty two, uh-huh. and uh, I went to. Uh, Deshi Kacha because I had a recommendation of some friends who said here's a man who is modern who there is no uh, strings attached to him to learning from him you just go there and there's no uh, it's uh, easy so I went to him and he's very authentic I was told and so I went to him and I knew that he had a big lineage a great master behind him as his father and so I was convinced that it's a good source but I was also very very happy not to be in the hands of a traditional uh, Brahmin scholar etc. I was very comfortable with being a young, a relatively young man who was in, uh, who was speaking in English, was modern himself and teaching yoga and that he could be my yoga teacher and not a traditional old Brahmin. Well, you mentioned that last night about yeah. how you were reading like Karl Marx and yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and these other scholars and yeah. you were looking to expand out of the restrictions yeah. of those kind of Brahmin cultures. Yeah, exactly. But then you said, oh, but he had the lines on his forehead this way instead of this way, which okay. was a little bit better. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and But I think that's, to me, uh, a very interesting thing that you said about Desika Char because... Mm-hmm. It does seem like Desika Char, for all of his um, being self-effacing and never wanting anybody to put him in any kind of guru position, he he did play this significant role in for someone like you or mm-hmm. for me. <laughs> yeah, sure. So uh, to um, allow for the teachings that his father were giving yeah. to be translated out to those other kind of mindsets. Mm-hmm. Would you say that that? for you that he was someone who also like you was looking, he had studied engineering and was looking to not just be stuck in this, but to expand to the whole world. That's what appealed to you about him. Not particularly that he wanted to expand it to the world, but that he was able to speak the language of the world, Mm. the language of a modern times, and that he was not stuck to the idea of how things have to be because tradition says it has to be like this. And he was, for uh, as a matter of fact, he was very strongly against this conservative line of thought and wanted to uh, has himself broken out and wanted people around him who thought differently. That was very nice, which is what convinced me to be with him because. 
I noticed it in the other students who, who he was having there, he, who were close to him, who were teaching in the yoga mandiram, the institution he had set up, that they were all young people who could speak the modern language, understood the modern world, but had a great distance to the modern world because they were all seeing its sort of uh, uh, loopholes, the problems which are going to crop up because of the way the world is moving, etc. But who, at the same time, were interested in the tradition but didn't want to, want to get into the tradition trap. Mm-hmm. So I found not only a teacher but a group of people around this teacher, his students, male and female, who were thinking differently. And that was very, very attractive for me as a, myself as a dropout. You know? mm-hmm. And so how did it go? Like when you met him, do you say, oh, I want to study with you? I know everybody talks about how you would write Desik Char a letter if you were in America, and then he would write you a letter back, say, please come, and then you could go. <laughs> well, no, how did it go for you? Easy. Actually, I had the recommendation of one of his students who uh-huh. was already teaching, uh, assisting him as a teacher. And when I told him I want to study yoga and I sp- and he's asked me, what do you know? And I spoke to him about one or two experiences that I had with yoga teachers and about my history of reading Marx and Sartre and Shankara. Shankara is an Indian Vedanta scholar mm-hmm. and other Vedantic texts. He, was, uh, he wasn't amazed, I was impressed. He said, I'm not going to teach you yoga philosophy, I'll teach you asanas because I don't want an armchair philosopher. Mm. <laughs> this is not armchair picked, philosophy. So he picked that up in the initial discussion with you already. Yeah. The he, very, he very saw first it meeting. Already, oh, you're going to be a philosopher, yeah, so yeah, let's do some very, breathing and moving. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the very first meeting, he said, No armchair philosophy here. And you'll first learn some techniques, physical techniques, breathing techniques, etc. And we'll see mm. the road as the road goes. As, as you go along the road, you'll see where it takes you into the world of uh, the mind and philosophy and so on. Okay, so we're, we're in Chennai, right? Yeah, yeah. And what's the year, do you remember? 77. Okay, so in Chennai in 1977, are there group yoga classes or is it always one-to-one? It was absolutely one-to-one. Yeah. The only group classes I had was on theoretical subjects. On theoretical subjects about relating to how to teach asanas or how what do these asanas do, and uh, uh, what is uh, uh, about and philosophical texts. And Krishnamacharya, his father himself, was uh, giving lectures every Sunday. Mm. They were also group classes in the sense his f- father was there, and there were a group of students around him, and they would uh, sit and listen while uh, while Krishnamacharya spoke. Mm. So they were group sessions, but they were all theory sessions, no practice sessions in group. Okay, and so the pra- you mentioned you had had a little bit of yoga experience before yeah, then. Yeah, So exactly. what was that? What was your other experience with asana prior to? Oh, I had learned term? some uh, asanas from uh, a grand uncle of mine. I had uh, learned asanas from two different uh, teachers, yoga practitioners I had met. I had taken some asana lessons from a teacher and I had taken some meditation lessons from um, a transcendental meditation teacher in Chennai. Mm. And these were the experiences I had with directly uh, with yoga. But I had been reading yoga texts like Yoga Sutra. I had been reading Bhagavad Gita. I had been reading, just uh, reading in English, in English translations. Mm. So Interesting. So you were reading these texts, but in English. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like I read uh, uh, Shankara or uh, Marx yeah. in English, yes. Uh, <laughs> all right. So then I'm curious, and that I asked you that to confirm that. Yeah. It's, it's something that I've come to understand that I don't think everyone does, that the whole convention of a group yoga class is an entirely modern phenomenon, it seems to me. Like, it seems like it, it was, at least in the Achar mm-hmm. teaching, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. it was always a one-to-one thing. Well, I may correct it in a small way. See, not when I joined in 76 or 77, but later on, there were classes for children. Mm. We started giving classes for children, and these were in groups. And then we went and taught in some colleges and schools. They, these classes were in groups. But mind you, they were all youngsters, mm-hmm. nothing above 20. 
see so they were all youngsters like in this uh, famous uh, yoga shala in mysore in the uh, palace of maharaja of mysore where krishna macharya is taught i'm sure there was hardly anybody above 20 there Well, that's a whole other story, I think, that yes. Mysore Palace and the picture we see of him standing on the child. <laughs> <laughs> But I guess in your practice with Jessica Char, going back to these, yeah. this first beginning of yeah. studying with him, do you remember the first lesson and what that was like? Actually, I considered that already as my first lesson. This short uh, initial uh, exchange where he said, uh, no arm there's no philosophy. armchair philosophy and you have to do... Uh, yeah. So I understood this is the problem. Probably this is also the problem why I didn't fancy this Vedantic uh, texts of Shankara or the existentialist uh, 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 works of Sartre. Mm. It was all too heady. Mm-hmm. there was something missing it didn't sort of really go into my bones so i thought i'd see it's not a it's a great idea mm-hmm. to not see asanas as something else but a way of you know opening the body for the uh, me- uh, mental or the spiritual thought so uh, well it made sense i thought that was already a lesson <laughs> yeah and then what happened he said uh, sri ram this young man is going to teach you your first lessons and that was his uh, primus his uh, main student prabhakar who uh, had been studying with him several years himself an engineer dropout <laughs> also and prabhakar took my first classes mm. so he gave me asana classes i came from a very poor background and i didn't have much money and he said you pay what you can mm. deshikacha mm-hmm. so this is how i started off mm. and do you remember the the forms that they they first taught you Well, I went by... You mean the form of the classes? Yeah, like what, what I'm getting at is that to me, when I first was exposed to these teachings, there were some very signature things. Inhale from above and exhale from below. And okay. some technical things about the practice that distinguished it from other approaches. And I'm curious yeah, if that was true much. for you too. Yeah, very much. See, I, when I was all young people, I was fairly fit. I would do exercises. I'd done asanas already. But this intense, slow breathing that really opened my eyes, opened my lungs, I would say, and the body. <laughs> so it was a very, very major experience because I remember I used to cycle home about two hours, uh, 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 no, uh, maybe three, four miles home. And it was spectacular. The body on the cycle, you know, after doing this one hour nonstop intensive breathing. And we were not just doing vinyasa, we were going to posture, stay in the posture, do very intense breathing and move very slowly into the posture along with the breath. So I really felt my spine and my chest and the trunk on the whole in a very, very unusual, singular manner. I had not experienced it before at all. Mm-hmm. And I was doing nothing spectacular. Mm-hmm. I know I had the same experience when I met Mark. Yeah. I was um, l- a little bit of an armchair philosopher. I see I see yourself okay. <laughs> and I was very trapped in this over exaggerated uh, practice of asana. Uh-huh. And then okay. he said, "Oh, just inhale your arms up and exhale your arms down." And mm. then I just remember it became so much more about um being aware of how I feel. Like mm-hmm. I knew what I was thinking and I had ideas but to feel something yeah sure and to have that be what practice was mm-hmm. was hugely significant yeah i can imagine mm-hmm. since something simple like uh, i'd been doing f- some physical gymnastics and a little bit of weightlifting in uh, late teens and so on and suddenly suddenly you go into a posture like what you what we call ardha uttanasana uh, your body bent mm-hmm. your the trunk is parallel to the floor so in that posture the teacher stands there and instructs you to breathe and as the breath flows in he says do that with your lower spine with that spine with middle spine and then move the arms so you stay in the posture let's say four or five breaths exhale do that to your arms inhale do this to your spine etc so it was a very very strenuous practice mm. so suddenly i was doing something like you know just freezing in a particular posture and doing some weird movements along mm. with weird uh, along with a very very intense uh, breathing mm. that that could change the concept of physical exercise 
so much or give a totally new experience of physical exercise that was interesting for me you know where you didn't need any you know symbols or what what you call them this uh, Bar- barbells yeah yeah barbells or and whatever and you don't have to do a big huge gigantic pose to Nothing. work stre- strong yeah <laughs> and actually we didn't have the concept of uh, uh, mats and all those those days yeah. we just stood on the floor and did it you lay on the floor and did the asanas yeah. so so it is it was working wonderfully all right you don't need anything yeah except your breath <laughs> if you can breathe you can practice yeah, right exactly <laughs> okay so how long did that period go for how long did you have the time to study with him like that i studied for uh, two years along these lines deshi kacha had classes with him every week mm. it was a small group class we were about three or four people he would teach theory and i would um, take one class with prabhakar one more class with sir individual Every, uh, so they had two individual classes a group class every week that went on for about uh, one and after two years mm. then i went to germany for a short visit along with my german friend mm-hmm. so we went there and we stayed there for a while and i lived there for one and a half years to two years mm. i worked a little while as an engineer too and tried it at that profession just also to convince my parents that uh, it's not all waste that they invested money into their son to study engineering so you left and, yoga for a little bit i, I mean i was not in teaching a, at that time sense. i wasn't teaching yoga at that time okay i was studying yoga i was studying ayurveda i was uh, 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 completing my uh, engineering studies etc mm-hmm. so i was uh, not teaching yoga mm. so i came to germany and then did this and then i had one student who used as a neighbor I was teaching him yoga because i was uh, I knew it and uh, then I decided I just cannot last out in this profession <laughs> as an engineer because mm. not because I don't like it and because I like yoga more alone mm. also because I understood that I will never be good in this profession so I left the profession because I thought if I do remain an engineer I'm going to do a profession in which I won't be really proficient mm. so actually doing what you call in yoga your dharma your duty is doing that profession in which you can excel in which you can be proficient mm. not in something which you know is convenient to, because you because it falls falls on your lap or something yeah and doing something to satisfy your parents aspirations is probably not going to pan out in not going to yeah exactly <laughs> but anyway my parents were impressed our son is in germany mm. you know as an engineer and mm. what better country can you be in as an engineer mm. so at least for a very short period of one year there the satisfaction they of son like they got something out of that money huh? and then i came back <laughs> and then you had to tell him but i sorry. came back with much longer hair and said here i am and no more engineering <laughs> but came back with that. Uh, we came back my wife and i with a little uh, and we had a child and mm. a small baby and mm. so life started new so, so i you, went back and deshika just said learn 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 so i had to go for classes almost every day oh, so it changed it's saying it um, it changed mm. and in the meantime my wife who was uh, uh, i had married the german friend of mine we became partners we are still partners of life and she is a bharatanatyam dancer an indian dancer mm. and so she also fortunately got a scholarship from the german government to continue her studies in india so we went back mm. so we went back with a major uh, thought more studying more studying so she continued to study dance i continued to study yoga mm. and deshika chava was more, more than glad because he loves people who are sort of drop dropouts <laughs> who have something to say and who have some uh, you know potential skills and so he was very glad to train me and i'm very very lucky well that makes sense like It's like when people choose to go back to school to study later in life yeah. compared to when they're in their 20s. I almost feel like I would have gotten so much out of college if I did it now. Yeah, exactly. Compared to when I was in exactly. my early 20s and yeah, I didn't yeah, know sure, what sure, I sure. had, yeah. you know? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, okay, so on this second trip is where it really solidified for you. Yeah. Yeah. So when I went back again to Desh Kacha after a two-year break, then it became a very, very intense studying. And then it became a uh, drill. Drill in the sense, you know, had to be there to be very punctual mm. and see krishma charya as well as deshi kacha you cannot be there even a minute late for class i mean krishma charya's classes i wouldn't even step in if i was 5 minutes late mm. i would just leave, uh, go back if i noticed i was getting late and therefore i always avoided being late mm. but deshi kacha's class 
even I would just not dare See, to step in even see, a minute late. That's interesting to me because yeah. you started earlier by saying like Jessica Char didn't have a formality around him, but there was still discipline, there was still oh, respect. Oh no, yeah. yeah. Formality a tradi- uh, or a sort of, you know, um, a very rigid attitude towards tradition is one thing, but discipline is a totally different thing. So he is very, very, very strict. Mm. And he would be very strict if he knew very clearly that I had not been practicing and the problem is you can't dupe him. See, I would, I would smoke. <laughs> you can't I would pay. go to. I would, I would even smell of cigarettes when I went to class. It did not bother him. Mm. But if he noticed that I had not practiced, mm. it would really bother him. Mm. And the punishment is, I'll get is uh, disinterest. Ah, uh, you lose it, which was worse. Yeah. Which is worse than like a scold. Yeah, actually, he would say, like, "Get out of my class. You have yeah. not practiced at all. Yeah. What is this?" Yeah. So I really had to make sure that that didn't happen, that it was really, you know, you want to You want to please your teacher. Yeah, yeah. You want to yeah, please your teacher. And moreover, you want to learn more, you know, you don't want yeah. to stagnate. And so I was forced to practice in this manner. Mm. Well, I've always, I went through like a disciplinarian stage. I think you kind of have to, especially... I don't know, I felt out of control and you have to have discipline. Yeah, yeah, sure. In order to maintain a practice. Yeah, so it's, it's true. It's got to happen. No, that's true. It's a, a, what they call abhyasa in yoga, uh, discipline is sort of baseline. I mean, it's a sort of bottom line. If, you, yeah. if it's not there, then it's uh, difficult. The only thing is maybe we have to define what is discipline mm. maybe the way we understand discipline in a corporate world or yeah. or in a school is a little different to the way we ought to understand it in yoga as a sort of self regulated or self uh, uh, decided a, dis- a discipline which you decide yeah there's a difference between discipline, about, discipline you get from like a, a military yeah, yeah. Uh, authority and the yeah. kind of discipline you get from your mom exactly <laughs> sure for instance yeah for instance yeah exactly you know that there's love behind it there's concern behind it yeah and here it's more than the love for the mom it's a discipline which you generate because you are concerned even more ultimately about your welfare Mm-hmm. than anybody else, you know, mm-hmm. ought to be at least. <laughs> mm-hmm. So in that sense, that concern will generate a discipline. So we have to tap that concern, you know, mm-hmm. for your uh, self and not in terms of I'm feeling good today and I want to feel better tomorrow mm-hmm. or I'm feeling bad today, I want to feel better tomorrow, uh, good tomorrow. But it's about the concern which you have in, when you project your life in terms of, you know, mm-hmm. a continuity, a long process, you know, which is uh, mm-hmm. going on. So... I mean, so that makes you feel, you know, you have to do something and just lie back. So anyway, Deshikacha helped us to get into that frame of uh, mind where, you know, discipline and internal discipline became necessary. Mm. How long after you got back to India and were studying with him again, did you start to teach? Were you teaching? Were you teaching? You were teaching at the Mandirim? I was teaching at the Mandirim. Two years. Mm. Two years I was teaching. Um, two to two and a half years. Me, I think two years, yes. I was teaching already because uh, I remember in, in the beginning it was very little. And I told sir, I'm not going to teach. I'm not ready. He said, no, you're going to teach. I said, no, I'm not going to teach. He said, no, you're going to teach. And I'm going to, uh, you're not going to worry. And in retrospect, it's not about, you know, him wanting me to teach uh, because he didn't have anybody else. Because it's like this, you know, people come to Mandiram, mm. they want classes, and he's got a, a crew of teachers, and he say, assigns the teachers to these individual people after having consulted each one of them individually, what their needs are, why they have come for lessons, etc. Mm. So based on their needs and, uh, uh, you know, uh, and uh, wishes, he selects a teacher mm. from one of the teachers, Eastray, who are his students. So he, one day he suddenly said, you're going to teach this person. It was a young man he was a little younger to me actually a young boy mm. so i needn't have been afraid but i somehow thought oh, yoga teaching i mean and me and but he said no and uh, so w- the thing is you need to build confidence it's one of the key f- uh, not for to become a yoga teacher but to become a yoga practitioner mm. you need a lot of self confidence Mm. And this self-confidence is not just about practicing, but also about, you know, relating, knowing to relate to people, to talk to people Mm. and to be non-aggressively teaching, Mm -hmm. you know. So the teaching 
was an extension off of your practice, which I've yeah, always exactly. thought. Yeah, exactly. So the teaching or making me teach was part of his uh, uh, program you. of making me, yeah, teaching me something. Oh. So I understood it that way and I took it and it was very brilliant in, in the sense I was with him then after that for five years continuously sitting there teaching and he would uh, correct each course, each, each program I gave, each class I gave, I would give a report, a written report mm-hmm. with stick diagrams, etc. and he would correct. And yes, the stick figures, stick right? Stick figures, yeah. So <laughs> it was an excellent way of uh, learning because everything was uh, supervised. And what I think is interesting and what's changed so much about the way that yoga teachers get trained and I've talked about this on the podcast a bunch of times where they've tried to condense everything down Mm. into like 200 hours that you can do in a month. Yeah, sure. And it's never going to stick Mm. the same as when you have to do it in the context of life over years. The sun goes up and the sun comes down many, many times. And I think that's changed. So it's... It's interesting to hear. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, if you if you want to learn to make films, mm. you go to the film school and learn. Then you go, you work under a producer, uh, under a director. And, you know, if you're going to do camera, you work under a cameraman. Mm. And you always need some not to just learn, but also to have a, somebody supervise mentorship. the way your a mentorship, a very long and intense mentorship. And this mentorship is as important as the learning and time and um, intensity wise it should be as much as the learning period you know Mm -hmm. so his mentorship is something very important and I think that way it was very advantageous to have had this mentorship with Deshika Chha for all these years oh gosh I envy it and I'm I'm curious what was your interaction with Krishnamacharyan it was uh, peripheral in the sense I would attend his classes that was once every week Mm. And there were about uh, 15 of us, sometimes 10, etc., who would attend these lectures. And then the second interaction I had was, which was indirect, whenever I had a major health issue, or my wife or my son, we wouldn't go to a doctor, we would go to Deshigacha. And very often, if it was a slightly tricky issue, he says, I'll speak to my father. So you'd speak to his father give advice, give medicine, which his father gives and pass it on to us. Uh, yet another interaction I had was that uh, once or, uh, 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 for about a period of a year, I had a class every week with a group of four people on Ayurveda. And uh, these were the group interactions I've had with him, these uh, two group sessions. He was, uh, what impressed me most was uh, he would come, sit, sit down, close his eyes and lecture for an hour and not boring <laughs> and extempo, you know, like, uh, and very consistent in his thinking and not, uh, you know, uh, traversing. He would have his eyes closed the whole time? Yeah. He would, now and then the eyes will open and you have feeling he looks at you or he looks into you or whatever. But most of the time it was closed. Yeah. And the thing was, he had a book in his hand. He was he wouldn't uh, he had a book in his hand, and he would sit upright. That means the, he was not sort of you know the book was not on his lap. His hand was up, and he his chest was up, and he was holding the book. But his eyes were closed. He was not looking at the book. So he would teach like this, and this was something very remarkable for me. <laughs> but later on, when I learned this, uh, took these Ayurveda lessons, um, he was not having his eyes closed because it was very textual and it was very practical and so he would open and uh, but there was a very it was a very small group of four people it was extremely interesting i was very 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 impressed by the diversity of his learning you know that he could you know without the text in his hands quote out of uh, ayurveda texts that are so many of them and they are so many th- hundreds of years old and uh, there is so much uh, he quoted out of all these texts to explain to us about um, this one particular uh, subject of uh, pregnancy and delivery which he, which he was uh, uh, teaching at that time and all this he knew and then those other lectures which I attended on the philosophical lectures he would quote from the Mahabharata, Ramayana, from Vedanta, from uh, some Sufi uh, uh, thought and from... Uh, he just had know. it. Had yes, it had. and Jaina philosophy he was very interested in, of course, yoga. So he was very, very widely read. And um, 
I had a very remarkable uh, experience with a san- my my Sanskrit teacher. My Sanskrit teacher said uh, he would like to meet Krishna Charya because Krishna Charya was a very respected scholar, mm-hmm. and my Sanskrit teacher was a good teacher. He was he was very he's a good scholar and good, very learned and very uh, proficient in Sanskrit. So I took him to meet Krishna Charya. So I saw these two elderly men talking to each other. It was like. Let's say you as an American, you go to India and learn Tamil in five years and you speak some Tamil and you have a Tamil scholar, a writer speaking. Mm. So that was the difference between this man who was a very good Sanskrit teacher, who was very efficient in Sanskrit, very proficient in Sanskrit, sorry, and Krishnamacharya speaking Sanskrit. It was the just... Virtuosity, right? The, virtuosity yeah. was absolutely... Uh, yeah. Mind blowing for me because wow. I've heard quite a few people speak Sanskrit, but not with that eloquence. It wow. was really remarkable. Mm. So that was a very impressive uh, uh, picture of Krishna Macharya. But what for one, one one of the very very interesting impressions was the very first time I saw him. You know, so I was at the Yoga Mandiram, and he was. It was the very first class I attended of Krishna Macharya. It was a Sunday. I'm not. I don't remember anyway whether it was morning or afternoon. I think. Anyway. We were all there, the students already, and he came, and I saw him walking from the road onto the uh, building and walking up, and he was very small man, but then I really had the feeling his chest, between his chest and this and his chin, there was no space at all. Mm. He was this ninety or eighty nine year old man. His chest was up so high. Hmm. I thought it was very impressive. <laughs> well, you notice his chest, huh? Yeah, it was very because it gave you know it gave the appearance of an elephant, you know the gait of an elephant. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know if a, if if somebody is walking, you so, say, oh, he's got the gait of a lion or a gait of this or gait of that, mm-hmm. and here's a man who's got the gait of an elephant. You know, it's oh. what I, the impression I had, and he was very small made, and I and I and I tell you, I had I was friends of Karl Marx and Sartre and all this. I'm not making this all up. I'm not. Uh, I was not open to any sort of no. oh, here comes a big master or something. You know, mm-hmm. I was not even so much interested in Krishna Macharya. I was interested in Deshi Gacha. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, but I really was very impressed. Mm-hmm. Very impressed. <laughs> wow. So now it's five years. You're there. You're starting to teach. Yeah, We're exactly. getting into the 80s. Yeah, no, yeah. that was then slowly. You know, there was already 87. Right. I was there until 87. Six okay. years. Yeah. Mm. Six, so seven years. Yeah. I the heard. Second trip. I was very intrigued last night to yeah. hear you talk about when the Heart of Yoga book came out. Because I know Mark for a lot of years, and I've heard him talk about that book. So to hear you say about how he showed it to you, and you were like, oh, I don't know, because they put the picture of uh, Deskachar above Krishnamacharya. Like, yeah. So I guess uh, my question is, from your perspective at that time, that's when Dasika Char started to make some trips to America and started to have Western students like the people here at this conference. No, no, no. He, Not quite yet. No, no, no. no. That's no, no, before. No, 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 no. He was coming to Europe in the late 60s already. Okay. So he was used to Europe and Europeans and no, no, no. But still, he had this very strong sensitivity, which is very normal in India. If today I publish a book and my photo is on top of my teacher's photo on the front is, yes. on, the, on the front page, I would feel a little odd. How am I going to present him this book? You know, so to the say. publishers <laughs> just thought that's the author and yeah. they put him on top, right? <laughs> well, I guess my question is like, it's that time in the late 80s. See, one of the big themes of this podcast is I came to yoga in my early 20s. It was like 92. Okay. And yoga hadn't really become a mainstream thing in America okay. yet. It was, it was happening. Mm-hmm. Teachers like the people here yeah. were bringing back what they were learning to people like me. Yeah. And it was just before yoga went from like people's basements and living rooms in churches yeah, sure. to people opening up storefronts and... Yeah it became this huge phenomena. And that period of time right in there is one I'm curious about. Yeah. And I'm always talking about it from my perspective, but I'm curious, what was it like at the Mandiram? Were you guys aware that yoga was taking hold in the West and that people who were students of Krishnamacharya, Mr. Iyengar and Patavi Joyce, 
were kind of starting to like create empires of sorts. But they taught different things. I've studied all those different schools and they weren't teaching the same things that Desca Chai was teaching. They weren't. They were not. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, actually, there are two parts to your question. I would say that, first of all, you know, for us in India in the late 80s, and uh, uh, it was not... Uh, we were aware that uh, yoga was popular in the West, but we weren't aware about the intensity of the popularity of uh, B.K. Zaingar or uh, Patabi Jal. We weren't aware. It was only just starting at that time. At that time. It was starting at that time. But uh, what we were aware of was that Deshika Cha was having a lot of students from the West and he was uh, traveling every year to the West and doing a lot of workshops here. And that there was a in a very strong interest in the West to sort of bring, to systematize teachings in some way or the other. Mm. So this this idea of systematizing in our eyes, in the eyes of us students of Deshika Cha went contrary to Deshika Cha's teachings. So there was always a student-teacher conflict in those days between Deshika Cha and his students. But he respected our opinion very much because he knew it was the voice which actually was part of his voice also. Mm. But on the other time, aside, he was seeing a reality which we weren't seeing. Namely, he was every year in Zinal, he was in Europe, he was in the US, and he was interacting with a lot of people apart from his own students who are very devoted and very sincere uh, in their studies of yoga. So in that sense, uh, he was seeing a yoga which we weren't seeing and he was feeling drawn towards bringing in some sort of systematization. If you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J. Brown Yoga Talks. To hear the rest of our conversation, please subscribe to Podcast Premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.